we want to talk a little bit about the signal processing and then how do we build the sort of tool framework for talking about the signal processing for sort of bandpass filters. Now we use bandpass filters all the time, particularly when we're doing acoustics um, in acoustic type processing. If you look at what you see in the first stage in the human cochlea, it's basically a set of coupled um, bandpass filters. Uh, one could get very, very detailed about what that means, but basically the bandpass filter structure is, is extremely important in this stage. And in fact, it's often used as a front end, and this is sort of what we're going to talk about for a bandpass filter structure, which is called a C4, uh, capacitively coupled current conveyor. And it's basically a two OTA structure, or it could be done with two simple amplifiers, uh, depending on, on different approaches and so forth. And in an FPA domain, we have plenty of OTAs, so we typically use that. We'll often build additional processing afterwards, which might be like amplitude detector and low-pass filters. Very classical things you might do in, in signal processing, not just if you're doing a single band, but if you're doing multiple bands. You're going to want to be able to understand all these pieces. And so you know, each of these would then be more detailed circuits, but basically, you know, intuitively, they do what you would expect. And you could imagine getting some very interesting frequency responses, one way of putting in a chirp signal that goes from lower to high frequencies. You can actually see the min and max of the of the actual signals coming off of this uh, both the C4 structure could be these nice oscillatory structures as well as what's coming off the min and max circuits. So it gives you a nice bandpass filter response, kind of what you would expect. Um, this would, by the way, be for a linear chirp, but what you would ex kind of what you would expect. You get very sort of nice different amplitudes depending on where you are in frequency, kind of what you would expect. Uh, you would ex and you could also expect a step response to give you something like what you'd see underneath here. And this comes from the simulation models, where you would see I'd have a step, various steps, and this would be for uh, four of them. This comes right off the example structure. You get four of them there, and then you can actually see the inverting, because there are an, actually an inverting gain, and you can actually see what its resonance will look like for sort of a low Q2, two-ish or so in this kind of structure. Now, this turns out to be really interesting and very important circuit. We end up using this in a lot of places. Um, it all also sits in the middle of our, middle of our tools, and it also gives kind of a sense of what, how important it is to then build a really good simulation model. And so typically to do a simulation model, the biggest thing is building a macro model, which means you have to be able to sort of abstract this uh, in differential equations. When you actually do circuit simulator, you're abstracting it as well. You're saying, what is the current voltage relationship? Here we're doing this within more the data more more the the data flow perspective, which is me now. I'm going to be dealing with signal voltages, in and out, uh, and so pretty much all the signals are voltages, even though there are plenty of currents and we do use them. But the sort of from block to block, the signals are going to be voltages. So when you look at it, we're going to be talking about what we you know we're going to have one you know write down one differential equation. We write down a second differential equation because there are two nodes, and you could use that to simulate. And that works out really well, and that's basically what the idea is. But of course, choosing how much you want to put in in the details is highly important. And it's not always obvious how much you need there. So certain models will have more details than others, but they generally should be agreeing with what you get experimentally. The other thing that's important is that sometimes you actually get a whole set of derivatives on the left-hand side. So you actually have to reduce that down before you put it into its normal form. So you actually had to convert this form into here to actually get all of this to work out. But otherwise, it's it's fairly straightforward. And uh, you know you might actually have some initial you know, intermediate variables depending on what how you want to do the computing and how you whether you want to store things or re recompute multiple times. But this becomes a very important block that we're going to use. I just wanted to give a, a sense of what it looks like and a sense of what the mathematics look like behind this, both the linear and the nonlinear, because all of this tends to find its find a way to be useful in many, many different applications.